In our last lesson, we looked at properties of parallelograms that defined them and helped make them different from other quadrilaterals. In this one, we're going to be looking at a lot of the converse theorems that are associated with those that will allow us to prove if a quadrilateral is in fact a parallelogram. So each of the theorems we're going to be looking at in this lesson will be a converse of some sort to a lesson from the previous lesson. So let's begin with theorem 6-8. This is the converse of theorem 6-2, and it states, if both pairs of opposite sides of a quadrilateral are congruent, then the quadrilateral is a parallelogram. Now with the parallelogram, we also had this idea that they had to be parallel, but if both sides are congruent, then they set equal distances on their endpoints, and they would be parallel as well. Now, theorem 6-9 is the converse of theorem 6-4 from earlier, and it states, If an angle of a quadrilateral is supplementary to both of its consecutive angles, then the quadrilateral is a parallelogram. And theorem 6-10 is the converse of theorem 6-5 from our previous lesson, and this one states, if both pairs of opposite angles of a quadrilateral are congruent, then the quadrilateral is a parallelogram. And this one goes very well, actually, with lesson with theorem 6-9, because if a single angle is supplementary to both of its consecutive angles, then they would have to be congruent to each other. Well, if that happens on both, then either way we have a parallelogram. So we're able to take these theorems from before and make their converses, and both are true, so these actually be, can be written or be made out to be by conditional statements. Now we are able to use these theorems in helping to do proofs and in helping to establish relationships. So let's take a look at how we can. What values of x and y make EFGH a parallelogram? Well, using our theorem on congruent sides, or sorry, on uh, supplementary angles, we know that if this is a parallelogram, then we would be able to take angle E here and angle H, and they would have to be supplementary, as would angle E and angle F, angle F and angle G, angle G and angle H. Now we're going to focus on making E and H supplementary and F and G supplementary. And the reason we're going to do that is because e, angle E and angle H both use Y as their variable. Angles F and G both use the variable X. So let's take a look at how we might be able to go about doing this. Let's begin with solving for y. So we have 3y plus, or sorry, 3y minus 2 plus y plus 10 has to equal 180 degrees. Now combining like terms, we will have 4y plus 8 equals 180. Using our subtraction property of equality, we have 4y equals 172. Dividing by 4, y is going to equal 43. So if y is 43, then angle H here is 53 degrees, and angle E is going to be its supplement 127 degrees. Now let's do the same thing and solve for x with angles f and g. So we have 4x plus 13 plus 12x plus 7 equaling 180. Because again, consecutive angles would have to be supplementary. Combining like terms, we come out with 16x plus 20 equals 180. Subtraction property of equality gives us that 16x equals 160. Division property of equality tells us that x would equal 10 after we divided both sides by 16. Now, if x is 10, 
then we get here 127 degrees for angle G and 53 degrees for angle F. So not only are consecutive angles supplementary, but both pair of opposite angles are congruent. So we've established the parallelogram in multiple ways. So as we're using these theorems, we can solve here for unknown values. But we can also apply this into other theorems, and we're going to take a look at a couple more before this lesson's out. In theorem 611, this is the converse to theorem 66, we have one that states, if the diagonals of a quadrilateral bisect each other, then the quadrilateral is a parallelogram, because we had a theorem that told us that the diagonals of a quadrilateral of a parallelogram would bisect each other, so a converse would give us that opposite idea. And theorem 612 tells us if one pair of sides of a quadrilateral are both congruent and parallel, then the quadrilateral is a parallelogram. So this goes back to that definition we started with in the previous lesson. And using these theorems, all of them, all five that have come up in this lesson, we can use them to identify quadrilaterals, or identify whether or not a quadrilateral is, in fact, a parallelogram. So in the figures that are shown, is each figure a parallelogram? We need to justify our answers. So as we take a look at our first diagram, uh, quadrilateral DEFG, we can see here that we have a set of parallel sides and we have a set of congruent sides. And theorem 612 that we just looked at told us that if a single pair of sides are opposite sides are both parallel and congruent, then we would have a parallelogram. Well, we have a set of parallel sides, and we have a set of congruent sides, but it's not the same set. Based on what's shown here, I could take a set of parallel sides and a set of congruent sides and make an isosceles trapezoid. So on this one we're going to have to say no, there's not enough information to justify that, these, that this is a parallelogram. Now let's take a look at figure quadrilateral LAND. And what we have is angle ANL is congruent to angle DLN and angle DNL is congruent to angle ALN. But what we need to do is find out, is this a parallelogram? Well, using our third angle theorem, we would know that angle D and angle A are congruent to each other. So we have one set of opposite angles that are congruent. And since the two angles, two main angles that make up angle L, and the two parts that are shown to make up angle N are composed of the same pieces, we can conclude that angle L, the measure of angle L, is equal to the measure of angle N. And again, I'm talking AL or ALD and AND. So we have two sets of opposite angles that are congruent and we can thereby justify that these are this is a parallelogram based on the theorems that we had herein. So using each piece we can pull them apart and identify the qualities of the parallelograms. But when multiple conditions are given they need to be satisfied as one. For instance in this, we had the congruent sides, we had the parallel sides, they just had to be the same pair of sides. So make sure you know how to use these theorems because we're going to be applying them and identifying quadrilaterals and parallelograms as we move forward.